Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Tier No, the last series of Europe. I'm your host, yeah, Mokalova. But, uh, Venez not Venezuela, but Colombia's looking really not great. But, we're going to read about Mini Mini Tekla Aparsen. Senators Johnson, Bennett, and Speaker of the House McCormick sat from the President um, across him in the Oval Office. Attention being the three congressmen so thick you could cut it with a knife. All the formalities have been dealt with, so all that remained was their assessment of how the upcoming impeachment trial would go. McCormick was the first to play the of the ice. The situation in Capitol Hill, to put it bluntly, sir, is gloomy. Nixon's brow furrowed. Darn gloomy, huh? Yes, sir, McCormick replied, not missing a B. When the articles of impeachment are read before the House, there's no question as to which way they'll vote as for the Senate. Justice took over where McCormick left off. In the Senate, you'll need, what, 34 votes to quit? You'll probably get 12, maybe 15 if you're lucky. Even if I put the fear of God in every senator on the floor, you'd never hit 34. And which way would you gentlemen vote? Nixon asked the senators. They stared down at the floor, the silence betraying their intentions. For a brief moment, a male storm of rage seemed to brew behind Nixon's eyes, but it vanished as quickly as it appeared. The rest of the meeting was rather unremarkable, and the senators departed the White House in a swarm of journalists trying to glean a hint of what went on in there. Nixon, however, would not reveal his thoughts on the meeting until he sat down for dinner with his wife and daughters that night. The girls were moving back to California. Oh boy. End of the line. Nixon stared at the faces surrounding him in the East Room staff for Secret Service cooks, custodians, all of them having served his administration as loyally as they could for the past four years. He decided to pontificate them for a few m minutes. At the very least, they could do, learn. They could learn not to do what he did. And remember, he concluded, though your enemies may try to drag you down, never step to their level, or never sink into pettiness and spite. Never submerge yourself in hate, because once you do, they will triumph and you will destroy yourself. It's been an honor. Thank you. He stepped out of the East Room to immediate applause. With all the paperwork signed and noon just seconds away, Nixon opened the doors to the south lawn of the White House, holding it for Pat, Tricia, Julie, followed by John and Jackie Kennedy. The press of course turned to re revel in his dethronement, a final twist of the knife. But Nixon took it in stride. He wouldn't be there for them to kick him around much longer. At the stairway to Marine One, Nixon shook Kennedy's hand, simply stating, Keep her steady, Jack. He climbed the stairwell and turned around for one last look at the White House, the staff, guards, reporters, cameras. He couldn't stop himself from smiling. He gave away a threw up two victory signs, chuckling, chuckling at the fervent applause he got from the crowd. He then turned around and stepped on a Marine One and into history. He was soon borne away by the waves, lost in darkness and distance. So then there goes Tricky Dick. The Kennedy presidency. Um, I think I read some before. Um, if you want to read this, please go right ahead. Oh, look at this guy. Kind of handsome. Men the riffs. Reach out to the Dixiecrats. Reassure progressives. One last chance. Bring back the MPP. Save the country. Well, we don't have enough stability. Dixiecrats support and labor support will go up. Meet with the people. Extinguish the flames. Yield the people. Swear on it. Shake on it. Well, we could change. I just want to see what what we have here. For one true measure of a nation and its success in fulfilling the promise of a better life for each of its members, let's be the measure of our nation towards a brighter future. The eagle soars. Well, in all honesty, because at the time I was recording, um, uh, as one comment said, why didn't you wait for the hotfix? There's a patch coming in two hours that will break your save. Why You won't be able to finish your playthrough? Well, I want to put it in offline mode like I did. So... I kind of want to support this group as much as possible. A little political power. Save the country. Um, Nixon's scandal was and still one of the greatest exec executive violations of public trust in more than a century. Rarely such an event so weak in American belief and approval of not just the president but the entire federal government. Kennedy's political allies cannot move forward. The people they claim to represent no longer believe in them or the institution they run. As such, with his endless charisma and good relationships with the media, he may just be able to reestablish trust with the people of the U.S. Message from Nixon to his successor. Jack, while the hands of fate often made you and I political opponents, I always treasure the fact that we were personal friends during our time in Congress. That friendship is something that I remain mindful of during my time in the White House, even if we do not always agree on matters of policy. I never wish you anything but the most profound success, and as my staff can attest, I've always spoken highly of you and your abilities. Sure. And in the weeks to come, I hope you will look fondly on our time working together. Though the press will say many things about my conduct in the coming weeks, remember that what I did was for the betterment of the country and the people. I hope you will remember that and the countless sons I've provided you over these past few years, with any luck. His business will soon be behind us both, and the nation will continue to think fondly of our many successes. If Pat or I can be helpful in any way, we shall be honored at debate your command. Sincerely, Richard Nixon. It ignites the owns of the United States before being filed away. The object of torture. Oh boy. Through eyes clouded by tears, the boar gazed upon his tormentors. A pair of young men, red hair, oil black, sleeves rolled up, hard eyes. He braced himself for what he knew was coming. Now that he was welcome. The torture began anew. One of the men had punched him full force in the stomach and the chest over and over as others watched, asking questions he didn't know the answers to after a time. The torture went to wash his hands clean while the boar spat blood on the concrete floor. It glistened like a harsh yellow glare of the sodium light. Next came the pliers. He was determined not to scream, but his resolve broke immediately as the frowning torture ripped out his thumbnail. The questioner continued in his monotonous drone, speaking the Africans of one who had not been born to him. 
where they were, how many there were, where they were supplies were coming from. All the board could say was that he did not know, but they were not satisfied. After the remaining fingernails were lying on the floor and pulled the blood, the torture went on to work on his teeth. After a time, the boar awoke. He wondered how much time he had passed in the dank, stinking cellar. He looked to wheel a car battery towards and attached jumper cables to it, then clamped the clamps to his nipples. The boar felt electricity light his brain up like a Christmas tree. For a moment, the shock was so strong he didn't even feel the pain, but it came, oh, it came. When he proved again unable to answer the questions, the torture swapped the clamps to his testicles. Eventually, morning came in an alley in the Cape Town, down by the docks, a nondescript door opened. A young man with slick back red hair walked outside in the dim uh, sunlight, rolling his shoulders and stretching his neck. Beyond him, he awkwardly dragged a garbage bag, its contents sloshing around with every step. He heaved it into an already overflowing dumpster, and shielding his eyes from the morning's bright light made his way back inside. Soon they'd be bringing in the next president. The lights, this last not for these men. You the politicians? I'm going to go do meet with people. The United States is currently going through one of the most difficult and critical times in its history, and the poverty is reaching un levels unseen since the Great Depression overall. Americans are tired, poor, and in chain. In order to both prevent further civil unrest and also lay the groundwork for future pu public support of the Kennedy administration, President Kennedy is planning a public outreach program that will so allow the President and others to directly address questions made by the, the General Council of the Senate. Senate. Senator Philip Aloya's heart of Michigan was close to the end of his tether. It had been mere days since information in Nixon's scandals and corruption had caused his presidency to collapse amidst impeachment proceedings. God, how it all infuriates me, Hart thought. How avoidable it was, how pointless all this corruption turned out to be if they wanted to ruin the NPP so badly, surely they could have done it through honest means. Honest means. That was another thing that Hart had always treasured as a senator. It was why the partly admitting, a partly just jealous congressmen and senators of the Capitol called him conscious of the Senate. Um, where he went, he tried him towards honesty. He had fought hard and honestly on the ruined battlefields of Europe, just as he did now in the Senate. Not seeking advancements of through corruption like the means of the former president, and so many others did. To fulfill a part, therefore, this ruinous man cut even more so quickly than it did others. How in the good Lord's name will this American nation care for its people if the president cares only about himself? This isn't a disaster than one on earth is it? Hard knew his tolerance was failing. It was only so long before he had to do something more about all about this rather than settling for being the capital's morality pet. He wondered what that would have to the be. The battles ahead. JFK shifted uneasily in his chair in the Oval Office. Nixon had resigned very recently and was still getting used, sitting on the side of the Resolute Desk. Not only did he have to manage all the problems afflicted in the government, but he also had to cast aside an eye ahead of the next election where the sharks were already circling. It felt like a man being dragged in all directions. Looking ahead to 1964, Kenneth O'Donnell, close aide, said, Looks like George Wallace is consolidating most of the support on the MPP's right, but the pact is such a madhouse that we may not know their nominee for some time. As long as it isn't Romney, Kennedy said heavily, I think we're in a decent shape. We don't want to run against Romney, no biases whatsoever, no drinking, no smoking, nothing, but quiet prayer and the decision to run with the message given by the Almighty. The president left Riley. Can you imagine any of us doing that? Um, let's see, give it this one. <clears throat> doing this sober, chuckles from the staff, present and of office followed. Washington had a way of driving a man to drink. My friend's in Michigan. Uh, the president's brother. Uh, my apologies. Uh, Robert broke in through the laughter. Tell me that the Detroit press won't be backing him for any run out of state. There's still our corner, for now at least, to want to keep a good governor close to home. The president's eyes closed in relief. One fewer threat in 64, thank God. Walls, bigoted populace, was beatable, particularly given his limited appeal beyond firmly segregationist quarters, but Romney the potential not only to unite the MPP under a moderate, but also poach reliable RD voters. Now about Africa. That's what it is, too. Um, the time, like I said earlier, the time is growing. The MPP is bugged, and they get, like, really do, they do really freaking well for some reason. So I'm going to make sure that we do okay. And, uh... Yeah, I'll probably redo, redo all this off screen. Current, uh, hide states. So, these are all states that have people up for elections. We'll come up here. Here we go. I'll be your offers at least. I'll tell me if you're ready about this. Please go right ahead. And I don't mind taking it over. Southern storms. The crowds lining either side of the street alongside Dealey Plaza seem like a colony of angry, righteous ants, at least from the rooftop with which Bobby Cherry had been laying on. Adjusting his scope and looking down at the people below me, he could see. He could almost make out some faces, though, despite the total lack of identifiable features, with perhaps a single exception of raised fists or furrowed brows, they could all be totally lacking any kind of features at all, and even a blind man could tell their hatred and anticipation of Kennedy's reconciliation rally. Uh, it was on the way they stood, the way they were focused on the street ahead of them, the way they seemed to totally neglect everything else around them, luckily for Cherry's plan, sitting atop the depository. It seemed like the whole world happened to be on him. Nothing could touch him, and he could affect it, none of it. That is what life had felt like until this very moment. But he left unable to leave his mark on Malaya, the Civil Rights Act, now even his own hometown, the nation, the nation that could reclaim control over his life was liberating. Some people below him began to scream and jeer. It was almost time, even the crowds to the point of him being nothing but a speck to them. He could hear their anger, despite all of it culminating, the escorts finally finishing, filing around the corner, and the president's car rolling into view. Lining his eyes up to the rifle scope, Cherry focused his eyes on the back of the president Kennedy's head, a beat pass. The crowds flung insults at the president, though too quiet to hear, were almost certainly present if his uncomfortable demeanor had any part to play in it. Another beat passed. Perry, Cherry pulled the trigger. The president's car sped off with the front half of the escort as the crowd dis disappeared like smoke after rain. The amorphous mass disappearing into, into its own pockets, fleeing the scene, gets the event commander in chaos. 
Um, just like that, Jerry left an impact on the world. With his main driver dead, the administration has pushed for civil rights starts to stall. No! McCormick, you look funny. McCormick presidency. I think I heard this one before, too, so. Um, Remember this, please go ahead. Burn it of power. Remain calm. Uh, maybe we'll read this one though. Shock and uncertainty sparked by the webs of the scandals and tragedies the coalition has experienced has not only shattered the public's confidence in us, it's frayed the tenuous bonds that hold the dynamicism of, of, of the two parties together. With many Democrats and even a few Republican senators openly wondering if the continued existence of the United Coalition is beneficial to anyone, drastic action must be taken to pull the party together if we are ever to have a hope of salvaging the election. President McCormick, we need to wrangle the squabbling factions into presenting a united front against the chaos America finds itself in. Restoring unity for both parties would be critical to allay the nation's panic and prevent a mass defection of voters from the Republicans and Democrats and burden of power. McCormick never wanted this. It's going to be most successful, for sure. He always wanted to serve the country and what he saw as a stable choice for the coalition, and as a senior speaker of the House, he had performed admirably, even if he did so, say, himself. Then Nixon lied and Kennedy died, and suddenly the Boston-born son of a hog carrier found himself thrust into the highest office in the land. The days seemed to blur together as he struggled to gather himself. The Oval Office was a whirlwind of activity, and the signs of politicians and sectarians, or secretaries, rushing to give him the lay of the lamp. More riding in the South cried one. The latest casualty report from South Africa, Mr. President, said another. The podium of the press conference was another beast. It lost count of the amount of times he'd utter the phrases national tragedy and difficult times for us all, in front of flashing cameras over the next few days. Or last few days. Finally, whenever he found himself a brief moment to relax, he'd pick up the newspaper and read it all about the grim polls, forecasts, and the endless rumor mill, and the countless reports of protests and continuing civil rights clashes and lines of coffins turning him from overseas. One night, sleep truly eluded him. He found himself in the Oval Office, sitting in the darkness, save only for the flooded lights, or lights flooding in from the White House lawn. His presidency would not be a successful one. He accepted that. He made no plans to run in the election to try and legitimize or extend his rule, but perhaps he could even study the nation well enough that he who came after him could be in within a shot of triumph. Sealing himself, the caretaker president prepared for the deal ahead. All we can do is try. Heal a broken nation. Well, the coalition restored to some semblance of cohesion. We must now work to win back the American people. With comments of the coalition still greatly damaged, President McCormick must move quickly to prove that we are still the best choice for the better American future. Through dedication and clear-headed leadership, he will show the people that both the Republicans and Democrats are capable of guiding the nation through the crises we find ourselves in. McCormick will also need to deal with his ascent. Ascendant and PP, we're taking full advantage of the crises facing us to rocket up the opinion polls. If they rise or be halted, we need to outmaneuver them in both words and policy, proving that we're truly the real, only real option to carry America forward. Um, let's see, a bit of reality. For the missing civil rights workers, the oldest was 25, the youngest 19. The car burned out in a roadside ditch, bodies found in shallow graves. McCormick felt sick and suddenly read over the report of stonewalling the part of local county offices of negligence and indifference on the part of the state government. A year ago, even six months, an outrage like this would have been responded with the full force of power of the federal government, FBI agents, sailors, and a massive regional manhunt and roundup Nixon couldn't tolerate it. Kennedy wouldn't have, McCormick would have, too. There was much to be done for our two little town, South Africa, the transition, Congress, and more. He just another town to bring Hoover and the South to heal. As the 38th President of the United States was ushering, or ushered to his next meeting, he glanced at Lincoln's portrait hanging on the wall, eyes following him judgingly. McCormick ignored it. The question of civil rights had waited nearly 120 presidencies. 100 years and 20 presidencies. We have to wait one more. NPP election primaries. An NPP uh, PAC convention uh, or convention concluded today with a rather surprising outcome. After multiple ballots with candidates representing each of the many factions of the PAC over the whole spectrum, the politics including Michael Harrington and Scoop Jackson have cleared away and emerged. George Wallace. <clears throat> And the controversial Alabama governor was well known and outspoken views on segregation support for the Jim Crow laws of the southern states focused mostly on his primary campaign, not on the debates of civil rights, but on the corruption of the current Republican Democratic administration and the using power of the federal government. He successfully repeated the progressive caucus leadership due to their division, thus handing the nod to Walls. In his victory speech, the governor spoke not simply as running as president for the South, but all of America. And it ended to give the American people a clear choice. I welcome a fight between our philosophy and the corruption of the heavy handedness of Washington, telling us what to do, think, and how which now threatens engulf every man, woman, and child in the U.S. I'm in this race because I believe the American people have been pushed all around long enough for that, like, that they, like you and I, are fed up with the continuing trend towards the corrupt banana republic, which now subjects the individuals to the dictates of an all-powerful central government. Walsh has a great support in the southern states and pockets of support in the conservative enclaves who despise the increasing power of the government in their lives, and millions more that just want to banish the corrupt and dirty politics of Nixon to the history books as fast as possible. It just remains to be seen as this can transit into victory in November. Will Walsh finally get the MPP into the White House? He probably will. The Choice in the Echo. Phyllis Schlafly sat down at her desk in St. Louis trying to rewrite her book, in which she planned to title A Choice Not an Echo. 
She's thrown out her first draft after the alter political landscape of 1964 were making the old draft worthless, of course. Richard Daddy Nixon, the brute that liberals were right to call a crook, maybe, had done himself in politically, and that struck Schlafly as being for the best. Then there was Kennedy, whom Schlafly had always hated, but with his murder, that had been an awful thing. No one could have ever wanted that. God rest the departed. She muttered as her mind wandered to the present Goldwater. I sabotage, just like that tap was by internationalists, had been forced to pull out of the contest. Now, the RDC primary was between LBJ and the feckless internationalist Wallace Bennett, a Republican in name only. The MPP was hardly better. Their primary uh, was split between the overly ambitious lunatic RFK and the unrefined, subtly racist liberal Wallace. Ooh, Papa Wallace. Deeply dissatisfied with what she saw in front of her political sphere, Schlafy. Uh, Schlafy, Schlafy, I think Schlafy. Sort of the old draft and a binder and put it away, hoping that the new version of a book would make a difference in 1968. She began to write the political elite kingmaker steal conventions from the average American voter on out. Basically, between this fade and fade out, I basically replay the entire thing here. Um, yeah, so not everything's going to be exactly the same. Provisional Komestion Muscovines. Um, oh, the game's lagging super hard, as you can tell right now. Uh, but other than that, actually, what is this? Das Government de Krim. Ah, hello. Um, we did get the Republic of the Philippines. They actually did it naturally by themselves. So we have this one a little different than we did in the last episode. And Madagascar is still the same, led by this guy here. Jach. Jach. <laughs> and we're actually doing really well in South Africa right now. We might be doing actually too well. Uh, we made one heck of an encirclement, and then these guys are just pushing through, so hopefully we don't win before too long. We did throw in more divisions. One of the other comments was uh, from the last video. Why did you not send more volunteers to South Africa? There, there's like four additional slots available. That is because I knew I was going to have to replay this anyway, so I didn't really care too much to do it, so um, it is what it is. And someone else said, coffee? And I said, ah, you know, yeah. I don't have any coffee. Some days I don't drink coffee because I have way too much caffeine. Like I have 500 to 600 milligrams of caffeine this, on a certain day, on, depending on the day. So, is that healthy? No, but oh well. Support the RDs. Speak of the house wins. Saving Nixon's legacy. Gambit, yeah, he was a crook. Not go over the Southern Democrats or Dixiecrats. Soul and torment. Uh, let's go saving Nixon's legacy. Scandalous to know, President Nixon uh, left us with a lot of baggage, intervening in the war in South Africa while an arguably honorable decision in the name of helping our allies has quickly become one of those controversial moves um, <clears throat> in recent times. If we're to recover our reputation, we must find a way to salvage Nixon's decisions turn his failures into a great success. Well, war propaganda must, be, of course, be ramped up for a further spin. This war is our moral duty. Efforts must be taken to mitigate the bad press. Um, we accrue from the goings-on in the African bush where every life, lo life lost or man crippled is another sustain or stain on reputation. Ultimately, efforts must be taken to eke out some sort of victory in Africa, an even moral one. South Africa is uh, an affair brought up by the actions of the Republican Democrats only by proving that there was the right decision we can prove our loyalty to President Nixon that was not, he was not completely foolish. And the African gamble, of course. No matter how one looks at it, the situation in South Africa is a giant freaking mess. Through President Nixon's misguided opportunism, our troops have been sent halfway around the world to fight and die in a conflict we barely understand. And the people are understandably growing more and more angry. Back down now, however, would be an act of cowardice from which we would never recover. Instead, we'll win back the people by winning the war. We must not only win the war, but win it quickly. If we can minimize the amount of time America spends bogged down in this quagmire, we can score a great victory for the U.S. So can we ride all the way to the polls? President McCormick is already prepared to order American troops to fight in South Africa to seal themselves from aggressive assault, aiming to cripple the Boers and Nazis as fast as possible. A ball plan which will require equally bold results, and if we fail to provide those results, the voters will never forgive us. Home by Christmas. More guns, more fuel, more marching. We can spare no expense if we are to keep our promise to the end war as soon as possible. Our boys on the ground will have to face a grueling long march into the de depths of the darkest Africa against the most horrific foes, but their suffering will not be in vain. The faster we move, the faster our enemies fail, and the, the faster they fall, the sooner we can have a great victory parade. The anti-war protests grow louder, but we must harden our resolve and strengthen our commitment. President McCormick has prepared to authorize a massive influx of supplies and equipment to the troops to help them keep marching, fighting, keep winning. That prize is too great for the victory to be within reach. Our boys will be home at Christmas. They must be. That's not the thing about what will happen if the coalition were to not. Mm, deeply unpopular. I don't know which one I want. I, I don't really care for either one. Um, present for the future. Because right now with the whole election stuff, I mean, the prediction is it'll be a solid top. That's going to be very solid. Like, Jesus Christ, look at that. That's so... Like, that's insane. And this is after the patch on October 16th, so... Um, also, prediction. I love the predictions. That's insane. I don't want the RDs to do that badly, so. But, you know what? Oh, well. Deep among the Northern Progressives. A soul and torment. The actions of former President Nixon were unacceptable, of course. But, uh, there are still plenty in many of the coalition who respect the man's policies and platforms. A not insignificant portion of both RDs, bureaucrats, have suggested that Nixon's actions should be firmly pardoned and allowed to retire gracefully. Nixon's former allies argue that this would allow us to truly wash our hands of him and stabilize the coalition in this critical moment. It was not proved popular, of course. Nixon's voting base 
or to prove. Uh, but pardoning his actions would certainly be condemned by other uh, <clears throat> people still, though. <clears throat> bringing Nixon's allies back into the fold will help bring the coalition together and the stability of the RD coalition is a paramount and of here we're at, success. everybody. In which we're still fighting, of course, down in the, the, uh, the, the, the Africa place. But lighting war for the war against the fascist menace is of critical importance, declared President McCormick, too. The assembled reports, but so, too, are the lives of our men. I want nothing more than bring our boys back home with their families again. Which is why we're making efforts to bring this escapade to a swift conclusion as possible as fast as we can. The conference was long and grueling. While claims were made regarding the war, McCormick promised swift defenses, of course, influxes of support equipment, various dates by which Bolerstadt and Luanda would surely be in American hands, but many other bold suggestions. Of course, asked tough questions. How would this affect the economy? Could the soldiers help to cross such vast instances in such a short time? How would be such? How would such an offensive? <clears throat> Um, oh my man, I just lost my place, oh my god. Uh, could the soldiers hope to cross such vast distances in such a short time? How would such an offensive affect the well-being of the men? The claims flowed freely and the questions came back even firm for what seemed like hours. Afterwards, McCormick found himself only able to hope that his words could sway the public back. A quick end of the war would not only free the coalition from the indignity of having declared it, but allow them back bask in the great victory over fascism that would arise from it thus. Of course, it rested on whether or not he and the armed forces could pull off such a victory. It had to work. It has to. It absolutely has to. Presidential debate. Um, while well, relatively new addition to the already tense and packed uh, election season, the televised debates um, between the candidates for president, the Republican Democrats, and the National Progressives, a part pact has become one of the most important pa elements of the campaign. A clash of wit, personality, and charisma, and policies between the two most likely people to become the leader of the free world is a must-see TV event. A public duty for the big three networks of C ABC, CBS, and NBC, and as well as respected cast of news reporters, including Edward R. Morrow, Walter Cronkite, John Chancellor, Quincy Howe, serving as moderators. In light of the tumultuous past four years, both parties and the candidates want to show that they are more open and transparent and willing to face down their point in front of live cameras, of course. Wallace have been a top ticket of the RD in the NPP's uh, George C. Wallace is going to face off in the uh, WNBC studios at Rockefeller Center in New York City. The debate planned to be about a variety of topics became focused on economics, namely the role of the free trade. Bennett spoke forcefully about how open markets, eliminating tariffs, and reducing barriers can help all the nations of the world, and his proposed international monetary fund can make war and conflict between any nation a thing of the past due to interconnected ties. Wallace, while supporting the idea of free trade, said that free trade should be free, seeing that America should only trade with those nations that have democratic governments and not with the fascists and imperialists. Trade agreements with India and Central America to prevent them from falling into Japan's sphere of influence would be the goal of his administration. The partisans of either coalition were quick to claim the candidate won the debate, but it's really up to independence of swing voters to decide who would actually emerge victorious in the polls to come and eventually election itself. Um, impact unity for the MPP. Or Wallace. Well. We're going MPP. Uh, and here we go. This is why I literally uh, wanted to show you this as well. Because of the whole submod for the election thing was included. So we'll see how we do. Well, that's not a good climate campaign. The Solid South. I think we kind of figured out who's already won. Jesus Christ. Election day. Good job, everybody. The National Progressive Back received 389 electoral votes. While the RDs received 156. So, good God. This is, like, even maybe even beyond the Solid South. Like, holy crap. The Southwest is divided. Um, New England is pretty RD, I'd say, but with a pretty good majority of um up here. We have 45 MPP total, which is not good. Um, we'll see. The West Coast solid MPP. Utah, uh, this what is this? The Rockies is solid, pretty solidly RD. Yeah, not bad. Interesting. You're going to build up because you're ahead. So not bad. Very cool. As now, we get to finish this up, which is actually going better than I have done previously, um, overall. So, in the meantime, I'll have, like, you guys, I'll do that. Um, in all honesty, just, like, go here, do this, and just, like, go. I don't want to be stuck here. I really don't want to be stuck here. But, with surplus, I did do a temp tax hike, which hasn't hurt our economy that much, in all honesty, so. But, cool. Home by Christmas. Passing the torch. President McCormick has done all he can with the little time he has. A few uh, last-minute campaign speeches and fervent assaults on the opposition might sway the odd voter here or there, but by this point, most people's minds have been made up, and as election night draws near, near all we can do is sit back and hope that it was enough. Whatever happens, White House must be ready to house its fourth president in two years. Preparations must be made for the transfer of power for the next commander-in-chief, and for the next first time in over 100 years, that man will not bear an RD next to his name. Wallace won the election. We must make sure that the handover is cleanly as orderly as possible and ensure that the principles and traditions of democracy our nation was founded upon are held. 
The way is nearly over. The polls are, ne are nearly finalized. It's almost time for the historic election season to come to an end. President McCormick and the closest advisor sitting in the Oval Office, fingers crossed, no one comes a moment of truth. Follow the leader. Here's to our good old boy, Governor Wallace. A, a rousing cheer echoed throughout the packed bar in Auburn, mashed in volume by the clinking of full beer glasses and fists enthusiastically thumping on tables to take us all the way to Washington after 100 years. About darn time, too, remarked a bird of the blonde man to his friend across the table once the second cheer died down. Time for the goddamn Yankees to know what it's like. His friend buzzingly looked uneasy. Well, now, blonde, he said. Election's over, ain't it? Fight's done. Folks up north got the message loud and clear. We can do our thing now. No need to go hassling them. Blunt and drained him his half pin in one before responding eyes already hazy from the past few hours of drinking. No, 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 y'all don't get it. George will be there for a while, but then what? Yankees will come on back, and that's what? He'll do his thing, but we got chip in, too. The big man swayed a little in his seat's face flushed red. F and liberals just rub up all the good work he does his first to answer the gap. Folks like you and me are the only ones who do make sure that they don't, that don't if they do. His friend shook his head dismissively and scolded the last of his own beer. Y'all are overthinking it, Blondie. And your boys, feds aren't going to stop us from, stop us cops from keeping the peace anymore. Don't need civilians getting in the way out of that. Uh, sure, sure, Blondie waved off the concern. You keep doing that. Me, though, and me and the guys, we'll be doing the uh, grassroots stuff. And George says, but now good word of some folks who don't hear it right. His friend has shifted to... His face shifted to a slow uncertainty. Now, Blondie, don't you all get any funny ideas? Like I said, we got it in hand. I ain't asking you to participate. I'm asking that you look the other way. Just like Washington will. Yeah. Oh, all the South African stuff down here, too. Nice. Also, stuff happened in Colombia. I'm not really sure what's going on down here. I'm trying to help them out as much as we can. Black mines? Okay. Sure, why not? Mines are nice. Let's well just keep pushing on forward. Um, but now is a little bit of dead time between now and uh, the inauguration of uh, the Daddy funny President race Andrew guy Walsh. takes flight. My fellow Americans, we face a crisis. Certain elements in Washington confuse this great nation with Germany, the fallen Soviet Union. Look at this handsome guy. Or they can order us around. No more, America. I guarantee you that for the next four years, you will be free. The states will be free to make their own decisions, free from failed tyranny. Just as our founding fathers intended. I promise you safety and freedom, America. I promise you segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Strong words today in D.C. as President Walls was inaugurated on this cold winter day. President Walls' spores claim him to be a champion to see its rights, while his detractors compare him to a modern Jefferson Davis. The new president is characterized by a strong populist rhetoric, emphasizing the struggle of the American people against a political elite. A major shakeup for the U.S. politics, of course, and shows that the American people are ready for change that the current R.D. platform simply cannot provide. And now a special report on the Russian anarchy presented by a man who spent years traveling the wastelands. Let's shake things up around here, my friends. And, well, Walls' presidency. The, new Mer the American people have chosen George Walls as a new president after one of the most tentious elections in U.S. history. He has a number of plans for America with regards to creating a haven for foreign and domestic business as well as reforming education and welfare policy. Of course, the big issue, the one where Wallace was truly elected on, is the Civil Rights Act. Wallace's victory proves that with the American people are not happy with having such a tyrannical policy force upon them by the central government. He has promised that under his government, states will have full liberty to decide their own futures, unmolested by the demands of either Washington or of violent mobs. His presidency should be beset by renowned outbursts of unrest from those who support the act, but is vowed to press on with his plans regardless of what some idiots might, who have nothing better to do but protest all day might do. President, a message from McCormick to his successor. Mr. Wallace, the day after I arrived at... Uh, after news arrived of your election, I took a trip to the Lincoln Memorial. I wanted to visit that civic temple. I wanted to gaze upon that wise and weary face of the man who waged war and died for the preservation of the Union and the betterment of its people. Would he be proud of where we are today? Would he think we've done enough to achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves? Or would he look across our nation's capital with all of its signs of unmet promise and weep? Well, of us know the answer to these questions. Despite the great labors of brave men living and dead, gross inequalities persist. Millions labor with no promise for liberation, no hope for equal treatment under the law. The toll of the suffering is evident in every American town, and the faces of the most disposed citizens is apparent in every alleyway, every prison cell, every segregated business. I'm proud of the work that President Nixon and Kennedy now contributed to the Civil Rights Act in 1963, technically, despite its limitations, despite the reaction it inspired, and despite the tragedies that followed in its wake, I would not go back to stop the bill or undermine its provisions. Those of us invested with the power and authority of high office have an obligation to do all we can to end injustice wherever it might arise. History will not remember much of what I said or did in my few months of the White House, but I hope to know the legislation that I and my predecessors champion. I pray that our people continue to strive towards equality, and that the unfinished work that we leave behind can one day be completed. I wish for you, for you compassion and the wisdom to exercise it. Yours, uh, former President McWallace, or McWallace, McWallace, McCormick, to Wallace. It inspires a bland joke from its recipient and then it's followed away without thought. Throughout the years of its dominance, the disgusting political chimera that is the RDC had increasingly infractured, infracted the foundations of this union with its federalist politics, chief among them the shameful Civil Rights Act. 
while opponents will decry President Wallace as some ridiculous frothing racist. His real agenda is simply protecting the average American from any more government infringement upon his freedoms, something any reasonable person will agree with. And yes, that does include the freedom to keep the imperial races away. A point of light, amid a year of bad news for the RD coalition coming off the defeat in 1964 presidential election, the results of Michigan are a cause for hope among RDC. In an otherwise poor year for RD candidates, Governor George Romney ran far ahead of the party nationally. His victory galvanized rumors that he would be a candidate for the Republican-Democrat coalition in 1968. Romney's victory largely rested on his reputation as a good governor, a politician who delivered for, for assistance without inciting grand court and division while living a devout life as a teetotaler, teetotaler who observed the Sabbath. In a divided country, many voters gravitated towards a style of governance that was different from the, from the R.D. blandness and the MPP anger. The formerly deeply divided Michigan RDC found themselves reunited and inspired by Romney and his philosophy of civic responsibility and reformist conservatism after years of stagnation, where the R.D.s had acted like nothing had changed in the state since the since the state. Uh, Michigan, again, seemed to be on the move. This only further harmed the position of the MPP in the state. Locked out of the legislature and governor's bench for years by the coalition, their strength in the state has been further reduced by the popular governor. Naturally, Romney's sweeping victory prompted media speculation regarding a run in 1968 for the RDC nomination and fell apart. A liberal senator from Romney's state of Michigan would be one potential op opponent. As would be the firebrand Barry Goldwater of Arizona, Romney would be the moderate choice between Philip Hart's unapologetic liberalism and Goldwater's strong conservatism. His position of welfare, civil rights, and other issues placed him with Nelson Rockefeller's responsible Republicans in America may well wish to make the good governor a good president. A Mormon of the White House? No such thing. Uh, power to suffering. Segregation now and forever. Wallace's favorite slogan, or famous slogan, my favorite slogan, has become commonplace on TV ever since his announcement of candidacy in the running. But now on a cold January morning, his slogan cut through the nippy air, coming from one of the many ecstatic American faces in the packed crowd in front of the Capitol building. All the signs they towed, all the banners they fly, every single thing they stand for, all chalked up to mean one thing, segregation in America taking a big step forward, and it was what the people wanted. Racist or fun people, like Asa Carter, who had so thoroughly been humiliated in past gubernatorial races, now took cushy positions in Wallace's cabinet that could have only been dreamed of in the 50s when they first tried. Segregationist judges became all the more common. Or fun individuals like congressmen who were already prepping to push bills towards behind closed doors, and the Democrats were consolidating the power all across America. Dissenting voices surged, but Wallace's supporters grew in numbers every day. As campaign's momentum now reaching a fever pitch, topping out for better or for worse. There's no telling how the next four years would be. Half the country crossed fingers that Wallace would fail, and the other half clenched their fists and threw them in the air, happy to celebrate in America they finally uplift that white man. They just have to wait and see. The fires of suffering. Oh, there's no signs on the high veil, for it's broken by the crunching of boots on the sandy road through the rocks and dust, the land without water, but for that deep in the earth's embrace. The soldiers fearing to step too far into the arid vastness and be lost to the agony and solitude of high places. Back by the bleak vastness, bleak vastness of the sky, the weary Americans pass through the crawl. It was barely a village, a collection of shacks made of rubbish and dry wood, a handful of emaciated goats and sheep who gazed forlornly on the men as they made their way into the end center of the feeble settlement. Their leader, a boy with a fuzzy patch on his upper lip, looked around him into the house and saw them gasped between planks of the swollen red faces, sneering at him with the hippo eyes of the conquered. Um, I think I read this one before. I might have read this one. Uh, maybe not. Uh, evacuated, he called once or twice. They only glared and snarled in the pig speech, and the boy felt his anger stoked at their contempt for emotion. And the mass of men approached with their strange machines, and the villagers watched them in confusion. Without further warning, fire poured forth, and the shacks went up in flames, screaming they went, began to flee, clutching babes and valuables. I did read this one earlier. Um, crashing to the ground as the shots ripped through the air, tearing into their sunburned skins and found some blood within minutes. The all consuming fires had cleansed the fire village from the face of the earth. All that remained was the ash of the bodies, the boy commander gazing upon the destruction he had wrought with faraway eyes. Sifting through the remains, the Americans found no evidence of the hidden bore cache they had come so far to find as dry thunder boomed with the high veld. The turn and return, the way they had come, between the jagged rocks back down the sandy row, ang angers like fire to burns all clean. And we're going to have to win them over. The National Progressive Pact's founded on one great principle, America first. American interests come first in diplomacy, especially when it comes to reclaiming our stolen state, but the needs of American workers and families first come as well. Sure, some of them may be on the fence about a government thanks to the segregation issue, but we're going to show Americans across the country that they have no greater friend than President Wallace. President Wallace will expand his support base with two expansions of popular social programs, Medicare and Social Security. But giving workers across the country some more federal support, they should be able to, uh, again, win victory again by grateful seniors and the newly insured. On shirt. Washington and welfare, hundreds if not thousands have gathered ahead of the White House steps to witness a speech prepared by President George C. Wallace. Some gathered to copy out and applaud the former Alabama governor. Some have gone to march against the President's expected speech and while some will just gathered and enjoy the spectacle that would be the speech and the situation in America today as explained by the President. Finally, President Wallace stepping up to the podium with a face ranging from confident to best to uncomfortable at worst. My dear Americans, I welcome you to the Capitol in this cold afternoon to remind you of your President's duty. Duties, as I've said before, is a word bathed in subtlety and its meaning undermined by the likes of those wishing to undo the greatness of our nation and their ambition. As we've stated time and time again, our good country remains written with the plague as its symptoms continue to rise. The President said, as some of these in the crowd brace for what they knew was coming next, yes, it's evident in the lack of options toward segregation in the school system and the workplace, but beyond this, 
Our nation has seen the issues rise in the healthcare system, as the sick, injured, and handicapped of our nation suffer the hands of the ISIS group of federal intervention. Manipulative bureaucracy seeks to twist and turn the path to heal, while the top minds of American business seek to create new, fair, and economically sustainable options for the citizens of the future. Moreover, we see a continuous trend of declining local power, the hands of the lowly heads of power here in Washington, D.C., reaching all the way to the American economy as more and more restrictions are consumed or constructed to prevent the people of the United States from succeeding in their freedom. My administration will do all it takes to work above and beyond the federal paperwork submitted by years of unmoving, uncaring political manipulation. Support the state, support the workplace, support the schools, support you, the president remarked. After his backlash and anger for the American populace, President Walsh was able to finally hear a noise which evoked a sense of beauty in his mind. Silence. Followed by widespread applause, with only a small crowd of protests marching on in the American battleground. This is a union, not an empire. Oh boy. Dirty state of schooling. Walls shall lead the way. Why would we need them? The PAX plan. Also, do we have stuff over here about our inherited duty? There's stuff over here, and this one too. Recruiting surge. Recruitment surge. Supporting our allies and whatnot, so. It's not bad. Expand media coverage. The Universal Service Act of 1965. Ramping up war efforts, which we don't really need to do. Where is the stuff about, uh. Ah, here it is. Fine tyrannies in 1776, which we're not gonna go with this campaign. Um. Lower business tax? Alien progressives. The bacon of democracy, freedom, and business? Foreign businesses. American businesses. Abroad. Well, I do want to go with this is a union, not an empire. Our nation is not some imperial domain or, or dominion where the emperor in D.C. can tell every man, woman, and child what kind of land he should live in. America's coalition of states, we each with our own culture, identity, and way of life. We, we got to let the people know this is how America is and how it's going to be. President Walls is going to go on the TV and give the people a very stern talking to, and the federal government's not going to hold your hand, nor is it going to trample over the rights of the states, after all. It wasn't a whole civil war over states' rights. Well, also, Indonesia's exploded, so. Yeah, they've gone completely kaboomy. And so we've got, yeah, Muhammad Hatz has gone kind of crazy. Insurgency uh, at 100%. That's not good. Loans for democracy. We don't have that much for the parts. We do need to say that as well since uh, there's a war there too. Oh boy, I don't want to get copyright struck. Um, so we'll see. Coordinate with Australia. Controls. Are you guys at war now? Not yet. Indonesia conundrum. Chief Henry Holler uh, sent a bird to the club sandwiches to go off. Delhi fair wasn't a speciality, but there was a major meeting going on upstairs in short notice and he didn't really have time to prepare a more sumptuous meal. Just a minute, he called down his well known Swiss accent to his butler. We're still getting a side salad ready. He took a short breath. What is even going on in the Oval Office? The thing with the pilot in the Australian boat, Alan nodded, so we finally had enough of them, haven't we? Maybe, but it's just another disaster to throw in the pile. Africa is a mess. We're stuck here. Now we have another war on the horizon in a far off place. I don't see why getting into it is being very popular. So if that's the situation, then I guess we stay out of it. Holler took a completely bowl salad and started dishing out the portions. There are too many wars. We cannot win all of them. We cannot get into them, all of them either. That's what the president's concerned about this, but the secretaries are telling him otherwise. Alan loaded the plates on his tray. I was in there. They were saying that Australians, for one thing, they aren't going to be happy with a no. They won't see that Sakarno fell out about as much as we want to see who took dead. And they're saying that the U.S. simply can't leave it all to them or the Japanese take the entire region. All of a sudden, as he finished dishing out the last portions, all right, Alan, I think you should tell me what the president decides. Turn up the heat. That's it. That's it. Turn up the heat. Surplus not doing too bad. Just keep going in, y'all. Also, we did some, some volunteers down here, too, so. But I don't know how many people we can send. There we go. Keep on going. Um, hello, this is good morning. Can I speak to Colonel Jupe Walru? This is Agent Thompson. I'm from the CIA. We continue to be no response for some time, even after Thompson waited for what felt like a few minutes, so we wondered whether you got the wrong number after all. The test was important enough to wait, however. If America wants to win in Indonesia, it needs connections, and there wasn't anyone north of Sulawesi who was more pro-fan than Colonel Walru. So we continued to wait patiently, hearing the shuffling of chairs and some murmured conversation in the background. A young man's voice suddenly came on the line and spoke in clean, accent, lightly, accent English. Is this, a, this is the Colonel's translator. Who are you? Thompson's was well, startled, but... Quickly gathered himself. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm Agent Thompson, CIA. We've been monitoring the situation in your country for some time. All of America is impressed by our movement's courage and strength. I want you to know that we have your back all the way. We'll be sending you supplies by air and submarine. You should get them soon. We shall be holding ground against Suharto's regime. If you ever need anything, just call us number and we'll see what we can do for you. There's another pause before the young man spoke again. The Colonel thanks you greatly for your generous help. We promise that your help will not be in vain. Let's stay in touch. We chatted for a little while after that, exchanging some pleasant treats before breaking it off, and as Agent Thompson walked back to his home in the dead of night, he felt a tremendous sense of satisfaction at another day's work done. We've done our part, he thought, now it's up to them. As we're down here too. We can, we can cut them all off right here as well. Yep. 
Can I just go into there? And take out Bogata? Probably. It's good. To us an echo. Huh. You're America, your future. America's assistance Republican, yet the King makes Kennedy Rockefeller. A lodge in New York wants to make claim to speak for Americans from coast to coast. America has no need for prince of will-be dynasties, yet these claimants claim to steal the country forever in their direction. All is not lost. But the road to claim America starts from each and every one of us. Make your voice heard in the boardrooms and parlor halls of power. America deserves a choice. A choice that is in your hands. A hard-hitting broadside against the accepted wisdom of our age. Phil Schleffy's a choice, not an echo, raises questions that should be concerned every that should concern every civic minded American from Robert W. Wildridge. Paid for by the John Birch Society, Indianapolis, Indiana. Surprisingly popular despite its conspiratorial tone. Win him over. Battle of Birmingham? Oh, God. The president could hear the cheering applause which had been exploded for the last hour outside the mayor's office on the 20th Street. Finally, the protests that have been uh, playing in the surrounding area was beat back. To allow the patriots to the front, speeches from. Walking down the hall along with a few officers, the Alabama State Police, Mayor Boutwell greeted the president with an awkward smile, shaking his hand with the corridor. The people of Birmingham were waiting there for you, Mr. President. Wallace and the state police seemed to burst out of the door of the mayor's office, inciting a roar of applause and cheers for the leader of the United States. Stepping up to the microphone with a wide, toothy grin, saying good morning to all the great patriots here in Birmingham, Alabama. As the crowd grew louder and more fervent, having served in the United States Capitol, I guarantee you one thing, my friends, the federal government is rotten from the inside out. Everywhere I've turned, the leading senators all the way down to some of the aides are looking to constrict your rights. Whether it be your work, your right to bear arms, you're all the way to your darned ways of life. As a servant to the American people, I cannot bear witness to such injustice happen to all of you, no matter what politician may want to choke the rights out of you. Segregation is a right. Segregation is a choice. And my administration will not only allow its choice, but enforce it as well. As we seek the top minds of the military of the United States is aiming to reorganize the protective forces within the mainland of our country, with the protection of state-bound militias, create and organize to guarantee your rights and protection from your hands of these political wrongdoers. I don't stand for your rights written in the Constitution of the United States to be gutted. I stand with you. As the president exploded upon the podium at Birmingham, his most fervent supporters cheered on, even bringing in some of the stable minds of the RDC. But, all the way in the back, those looking to protest continue to try to get closer, only to be, get beat back and pushed back by the Alabama State Police. Against this world, we stand strong. Uh, as we would basically expect more states' rights legislation to be passed. This is a family of states, my friends. We are not a crisis. You need to focus increased states' authority to take this focus. The United States is our home. Like many homes, it's home to a family. Every member is unique and has their own agendas and symbols, systems of beliefs, but they should ultimately work together to keep this household running. Those members sometimes argue, and that's okay, because what family is perfect. Well, it's not as the case for the head of the household to beat down anyone who doesn't like what they're doing. This is a situation with the states and the federal government who tell the states that they can't do things that they want to do because some man in Washington thought it was unfair. President Wallace intends to present this argument to the American people. Just because some states think things like segregation are wrong does not mean others can't stand differently. Absolutely. I'm glad we all agree. So we're going to say we're not going to do anything there because South, South Africa is pretty much done. But still. Cutting a deal. Oh boy. Healthcare reform, social security reform. We can close out that one for now. Good luck. Unhappy, unhappy. The pact for, uh, bounces the needs of the worker and the businessman. I said they're at war. Are they really at war? Not really at war. Nice. I'm just going to completely ignore South Africa at this point. I so just us, the set, and forget. We're almost there. Oh, we're defeating these guys too. Bogota. Nice. There you go. New Granada. These are the fascists, say. Eh? We can come up here and probably, probably have to destroy these guys, probably. I don't know, we'll see. Oh, we have more military factories, nice. Do we need anything? I don't know, here, some of that. That just takes over Ecuador, huh? We can send one, so we'll send a thing of fighters in. It's fine. Well done, gentlemen. So now they should have like not, shouldn't be able to do very much against us. She bears priority. She donate all any. Oh, hello! They did it without us. Nice job, guys. Union, not an empire, my friends. Free states authority. While the state governments have many rights within their borders, there are some things that they've waited until some pencil push from Washington tells them they're allowed to do. 
and the time that the bureaucracy takes to churn out its permission slips, so the opportunity to act passes. We've got to cut red tape and allow the states to act on their own initiative. They'll make the job easier, make your job easier, make these loudmouth losers in the streets shop or lack thereof a heck of a lot easier. State police over federal. In her, their efforts to protect and serve, the federal government has it in its past. Sent their own goons as reinforcements to put down so called riots by those opposed to their tyranny. Also, it's tolerated in the great free country deposits of belief. Yeah, enough is enough. We're going to tell the federal authorities to get the heck back to Washington to go look for actual enemies of America. The states themselves will be given total authority to use their own local forces to deal with the issues of AC fit. Issues like these violent mobs of progressives, for example, and legitimize the state's authority. The federal government and the, and the state government do not always see eye to eye on things, nor should they. The states, after all, have a more clear picture of what is best for them than their ivory tower politicians in the capital who are too busy making sure the Japanese don't blow up the world to care. So the state government should have much more of a say in how they're governed, specifically with regarding or regards to ensuring that the Constitution is abided by. State governors might consider certain laws to be unconstitutional, so should have the right to reject and avoid any directives that defy the Constitution, per their perception of it at least. But I think I'm going to end it there because I've played this for like four hours already. So if you enjoyed the video, though, leave a fat like for George Wallace. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow to see what else we can do with George Wallace as we continue to take out the rest of Nazi Africa, maybe even Southeast Asia, as well as uh, parts of, uh, well, South Africa. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous rest of your day.